Good day. It's good to have you here today joining me for this episode of From the Executive Director's Desk. And we're actually at my desk um, on this particular day when we're filming on, on Monday, um, March 14th. Kevin and I, um, the individual behind the camera, and I have been talking a bit about Russia and the Ukraine, as, as most of us have been talking about the Russia and Ukraine, right? And um, Kevin has reminded me that I have a somewhat of a unique perspective because I lived in, in Russia for um, almost two years, 18 months, a year and a half. Um, and, and, I, and I understand, or, or at least from that experience, there's, there's some particular understandings or gleanings that I, I gained during my time there. And I wanted to share a little bit of that. I think what I realized my time in Russia, and to give you a time frame, it was in 2000, um, for a year and a half, Russia in many ways <laughs> defied convention and defied my own understanding. We spent a few, few weeks studying Russia and studying Russian customs and the people of Russia before actually going over to Russia. And my time was spent primarily in Novosibirsk, which is the Siberian capital of Russia. And again, um, much of what I experienced there defied <laughs> my understanding of Russia, my understanding of communism, my understanding of really the Iron Curtain coming down. In politi political reach, whether it's influencing people, neighbors, policies, nations, halfway across the world, you know, I think Russia's massive. The unusual thing about Russia, though, is its economy is smaller than Canada's. Its economic workings are, are also confounding. I guess when I was there, I found it a really um, bizarre and yet beautiful place to be and to live. And when I arrived, I spent my first three weeks living with a family, and they were Ukrainian, living in Siberia, because um, they're siblings, they're cousins, right? And, and so many of the Ukrainians were in Russia, and Russians in the Ukraine, and, and their border was very fluid. And what was interesting, or what I found out after a couple of weeks, is my Hezeika, or the housewife, she was a teacher, um, of biology at Akadem Gorodok, which is the academic university in Novosibirsk, and it was the place where so many of the intelligentsia um, during the communist era in Russia from St. Petersburg and from Moscow, who were dissidents, who were oppositional to the communist government, where they had, had been moved to, right? The Siberian kind of wilderness in this newish capital city which looked very typically Russian, if there is such a, such a thing. Kind of block homes, stone homes, stone um, dachas, wood dachas, uh, a very, very interesting and complex culture. And what I found out from, from the family I lived with, she being a teacher and educator of biology, and he was actually an administrator at the university, what I found out that was really profound was they hadn't been paid for several years, but maintained their jobs because if you didn't maintain your job, um, you would lose your job and you would also lose, in a sense, your social standing. So they were government employees, hadn't been paid. Um, and what they did in their free time in the evenings with their, their young son who was 17, that by the way I was supposed to teach English to, wasn't doing a very good job and he was supposed to teach Russian, um, to me, they would make shopkas or fur hats and sell those fur hats in the marketplace um, to some of the Russian folks, but generally to people that were visiting that wanted one of those really traditional fur hats. And that was what was very interesting about the, the economy and the conditions and the way the people in Russia and Novosibirsk survived, and I can only speak from my experience there in Novosibirsk, is that kind of at the morning, in a morning's notice on the two radio stations that were there, that were both government radio stations, they would announce that the water's gonna be turned off for three or four days. 
and the family or individuals would collect water then in large barrels or large containers and use that water to bathe in or use that water to wash their hair or wash their clothes or to cook with. Um, and, and that was pretty commonplace. At first, of course, it shocked me and the family I lived with for the first time, the water was turned off for two days. They found it very, very important that I was the one who had access to the water first because that's kind of how they were. They were incredibly gracious, but some of the most resilient people I think I've ever met. Most of the Russians that I met were incredibly resilient. And during my time there, it was also interesting that my experience of shopping, and it may be different now, but according to my friends that still live there, it is similar, is you do most of your shopping at kiosks, right, along the, the roadways or the walkways. Um, you do most of your shopping in the open air market, which is where you found your meats and your vegetables. Um, and then they had what would be somewhat like a grocery store, except within the grocery store, within the store, there were kiosks. And there was one kiosk that sold shampoo and you had to buy your shampoo at that kiosk. There was another kiosk that sold candy, another one that sold, um, that sold frozen goods, or another kiosk that sold um, toothpaste and toothbrushes. Uh, another one that sold hairbrushes, and you'd have to pay for those at each one of the kiosks, so they were just indoor kiosks in essence. So shopping would take almost a whole day there, right? You pull your cart with you and get what you needed. And I remember one time when I was there, I really had a hankering, like a real hankering for peanut M&Ms. Um, I hadn't had anybody for any peanut M&Ms for several months, and so I kind of walked around town and I actually found a kiosk that had not the brand peanut M&M's, but they had M&M's that were uh, peanut filled, right? And they were um, various American baseball and football teams stamped on the outside and in the colors of those teams. And so I bought about five bags and shared those with a lot of my friends there. Um, but it was a very, very different way to live and a very different way to be. And as most of you probably know, 1940 to 1991 was the time when we said there was an Iron Curtain. In 1917 to 1991, Russia was, was announced to be a communist country. And then there was the coup against Gorbachev, sealed the fate of the Soviet Union, right? Planned uh, by hardline communists. And the coup diminished Gorbachev's power and propelled Yeltsin and the democratic forces to the forefront of the Soviet and Russian politics. But to be really clear, when I was there, it was as if the KJB had just become Russian mafia. There were still these long black stretch limousines um, that the people of power, the men of power in black suits would emerge from and go into secret meetings in secret places. And the family still lived with so much fear and so much anxiety that they really didn't share out of school, right? They were afraid to share their personal feelings with neighbors, with friends, and sometimes even with me coming from the United States because they felt they were being watched or that somebody would share that information um, and they might lose their position, lose their power, lose their influence, and maybe even lose their lives. So again, fast forward a bit. Living with this Ukrainian family, I came to realize that the Ukrainians and, and Soviet Russians were siblings, were cousins, a very fluid line. And that's what really concerns me right now with what's happening in Russia. Of course, I don't know, understand all the dynamics, all the politics, but what we do know is that we're seeing um, Russia unprovoked attempting to overthrow the Ukraine and Ukrainian governments, um, doing it kind of city by city, country by countryside by countryside. Um, and it's really a sad thing. And I think the people of, of Russia are having a very difficult time as they're attacking their Ukrainian neighbors. Um, because again, as I said, they're like siblings, like family, like cousins. Um, and they really kind of have understood themselves to be in, in many ways, one culture and one people. And as you look at the Ukraine and you look at Russia and you look at so many of those Eastern Bloc countries, so much of their of their culture is so similar and it's so steeped in in some of the fear of communism and the fear of the government and the fear of the other um, and it's really a sad it's really a sad day to see what's happening in Russia and the Ukraine and I just wanted to share a few of those words and really encourage you as you as individuals who are watching 
um, this video uh, to put to put your prayers and your energy um, toward the people of the Ukraine and the people of Russia both because this is such a difficult challenging time and potentially I guess it's not surprising because it seems like as human beings and as governments as much as we think we've evolved it appears that we haven't really evolved and it still seems to be self-interest especially on the, on the behalf of politicians. And I think there are really good lessons for us to learn from what we're seeing happening in the Ukraine and in Russia for us as Americans living in this country or wherever you live. Um, that I think absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the abuse of power is, um, is always deadly and it damages. Um, and that happens within organizations, it happens in politics, it happens in the workplace, it happens in businesses, it happens in our homes. Um, and I think it's time for us to, uh, to check in with ourselves as human beings who, are, who have said that we've evolved and we've moved beyond to really look for those places of peace. Um, not just outside, but a place of peace within us so that we cannot abuse, so that we don't abuse power um, that we don't abuse the gifts that we've been given to uh, by the divine and the gift of each other. And, and so those would kind of be my words of remembrance today. It's not as if, um, <laughs> from my perspective and my seat, um, I, you know, I don't have any answers. Um, I have reflections. I probably have quite a few objections because I fell in love very much with the people of Russia. They were beautiful. They were kind, they were considerate. And once you um, became friend, they would call you friend forever. And I'm still in touch with some of those individuals via email. And of course I was there with the Lutheran Church at the time, um, doing leadership development and helping to plant new communities of faith among the Akadem Gordok or the university students there because I had come out of, out of campus ministry. And I found those students, some of the most amazing students that I'd ever met. They were brilliant. They studied incredibly hard. Um, and they also played hard. Um, and they also loved hard. And they also really loved their country, but also felt that, that sense of oppression and wanted to find ways to, to leave Russia and go to places where they felt a greater sense of freedom. So again, as, as we're seeing this happen, as we're maybe um, in our minds the communism broke there i think i think communism socialism democracy whatever form of government we have can become abusive um, and so just keep that in check remind yourself of that um, and and i think as i look at um, as i look at the life of jesus or i look at the life of muhammad or i look at the life of many great leaders and movements for equity and justice um, it wasn't really about using or wielding power, but it was really about setting down the sword, um, seeking ways to create peace rather than create division and to create unity. As I see Jesus and Muhammad and, and Gandhi and other great leaders, um, they really were seeking to promote, promote goodness and peace and love um, and gentleness. And so, I would encourage you in the same. I know that's what we try to do here at Back Bay Mission, is with the people we serve, we really seek to share love and compassion and mercy um, with people that have, have been pretty beaten up by the culture and the society, people who are often ignored because they're unsheltered or they're living in poverty, um, and people who have power or more power tend to ignore them or just give them a passing nod. But here at Back Bay, we really try to listen to their story. Um, we try to give them a hand up and not a hand down and encourage them to, to really find the life that they desire. And so thank you for joining me today. Remember to keep uh, the Ukraine people in Russia in your ongoing prayers and your reflections, realizing that they, in a sense, are one people and that we are united with them and they are united with us, that we are one people across the globe. If there's anything that I think COVID should have taught us, it's that, um, that we are united. We may have different viewpoints. We have, may have different politics. We may have different policies. We may have different ways of living and being. 
um, but we are one people because we are on this same whirling globe. So thanks for joining me today. May you be blessed. Um, and if you have any reflections back, feel free to email me here at Back Bay Mission. Um, and as always, we ask for your support of Back Bay that we can continue doing our good work of bringing unity and love and peace and mercy to the people that we serve. Thank you.